I'm uh, in our global investigations and strategic <coughs> intelligence practice, and uh, I've spent an increasing amount of my time as an expert witness in TCPA and data privacy cases. Thank you. Hi, Marco Sasso. I'm with Ballard Spar and in the Consumer Financial Services uh, Group in litigation. And I spend uh, really my entire career has been in, in the space defending uh, lenders, banks, um, in consumer related cases, class action defense, uh, in individual matters. And um, I've been working, like I said, uh, my entire career in, in this area and um, I've been opposite many cases, so um, I think it's going to be a good program today. And thank you, and I'm Matt Loker. I'm a partner at the Casarini Law Group and also professor of contracts at the San Luis Obispo College of Law. So in that role, I just want to make clear that I am the person that actually accepts the bribes to the law school. So if anyone's <laughs> interested, we really need the money to small school. Uh, what sport? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Growing? Any of them. We'll make it work. Okay. So as Marco said, my practice solely focuses on consumer protection law, TCPA obviously. Beyond that, we're seeing a lot more Identity Theft Act cases. Uh, just you know, given the nature of how everything's electronic, we're seeing a lot of interception and problems. Uh, but with that being said, you know, we can jump right into things. I know we're behind. Uh, just a little outline of what we're going to do. I'm not going to spend an awful lot of time on these materials but because uh, there's a lot there and I think we'd rather just have a discussion. But uh, I just wanted to briefly talk a little bit about what we're, we're going to chat about. We're going to talk, because this is a money and ethics conference, uh, we're going to talk about money and we're going to talk about ethics. Uh, and that's going to be why are these cases being filed? How valuable are they? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about professional plaintiffs. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how these cases get settled and how they get valued for settlement. Just to tee this up a little bit, this shows you, and this just uh, this is uh, cuts off at 2016. It keeps going up. The number of TCPA law lawsuits filed by consumers, you know, is going through the roof. Uh, through uh, TCPA litigation by industry, by far and away, financial services are uh, are the biggest target. Uh, deep pockets there, lots of telephone calls being made for debt services, et cetera. Uh, and you can find them, which is not the case with these scam likely calls that uh, everybody gets so annoyed with. Um, verdicts and settlement, one that's missing off there, uh, there is a verdict last, I think last week or two weeks ago in Oregon for $925 million, uh, which explains a little bit why these cases tend to get settled. Um, so there's a little bit more. Um, first, I want to talk about potential damages. Um, Matt and Marcos, maybe Matt, uh, Matt, you can start and then Marcos can. Can you explain why and how the damages work in these TCPA cases? Absolutely. So the damages, for those who aren't aware, it's, it's per violation. So for every single, and we'll focus solely on the calls to cell phones because that's usually where the litigation is coming from that at least Marcos and I see. So to have a violation, it's a call to a cell phone using an auto dialer without the consumer's prior express consent. When we have all of those elements met, damages are going to be either $500 if the violation is negligent or $1,500 if the violation is intentional. So we're multiplying four years worth of phone calls. And those phone calls using the auto dialers, they're placing hundreds of thousands of calls all at once. So as, as Peggy mentioned with that verdict out of Oregon, it was $925 million based upon you know, a million and plus calls. So when we're multiplying 500 times four times thousands of calls, they increase exponentially very quickly. Yeah, I mean, just to add on a point that Matt was saying, I mean, it, our focus is, is primarily phone calls, but yeah, it applies to text messages as well, um, where I think the text messages is where you can see them rack up very, very, very quickly because many times people set text alerts and just forget. Um, and there are still fax cases. So I don't know who exactly is using faxes, but <laughs> doctors. doctors it seems to be primarily. Um, and so that they, they still come up in that context. Um, there's also a you know, distinction between non-telemarketing versus telemarketing. We won't get into details there, but that's something to be aware of, that if you are telemarketing, you have a higher standard of, of consent that you have to prove as a defendant, so be mindful of that. Um, a 
and they do rack up very quickly. So I think that sort of answers your next question, which is why, why are these cases so attractive to class action counsel? Um, are these cases easy to prove? Um, are some cases harder than others? What's an attractive case from your perspective? It certainly depends on your, your definition of easy. So what makes them attractive class cases is the fact that consent is usually going to be the ultimate question that precludes either class certification or your, your merits questions. What makes it attractive from the, the plaintiff's bar's perspective is that most businesses are obtaining or not obtaining consent in a u uniform method. So for example, when you enter into a contract with a bank or really any entity, if you provide your number on that contract, that would be deemed consent. And where it becomes a classical issue is everyone is providing consent in that uniform manner. You also have um, you know, revocation of consent class actions. And again, what makes it a, an appropriate class action, in my opinion, is that when a consumer revokes consent, that business pursuant to TCPA is no longer able to provide calls. And upon revocation, what we'll see within those account notes is some sort of code saying, do not call. A DNC, or we had a class in Arizona that was wrong number, uh, so WNDNC, that was all electronically searchable. So with that electronic search, we were able to prove or disprove uh, class merits, um, or sorry, class certification was appropriate in mass. I do know that, that Marcos, unfortunately for me, defeated class in, in a similar scenario just last yeah, week. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, without getting into specifics of the case, I mean, sure. from our perspective, you know, as the defendant, you bear the burden on consent. So you need to prove it to the judge. And it raises a couple things. You know, where are you getting your phone numbers? How are you tracking them? And what are you doing with revocation? Um, and yeah, the use of wrong, well, well, for today's purposes, we'll call them wrong number codes. Um, you know, what you have to show for class certification is, you know, many times those codes are not true wrong numbers. They are not you know, this is not me, stop calling. They can be a host of things. They can be a default um, just to stop the calls because the liability is so potentially high that, that many lenders, banks, callers take a very conservative approach and anything that may remotely sound like a wrong number, they're gonna shut it off. Um, which leads to the big fight becomes that class certification demonstrating really, you know, we have the burden of consent they have the burden of demonstrating that they can prove and resolve claims on a class-wide basis using common proof. And what we are looking to do when we're defending is showing to the judge, showing to the court that no, you can't do that, absent going and looking at each individual record. It might be helpful to get some little context in the type of evidence which is at stake here and what uh, gets reviewed. There are dialer databases, very large SQL databases that may house literally a billion telephone calls over the course of a couple of years. And they are, uh, and they interact with software that the customer <coughs> service agents, then when they're making phone calls and reaching people, they do drop downs and it may say no consent, revoked consent, wrong number, uh, good number, right party contact, et cetera. And depending upon how each of the consumer, um, uh, con um, uh, the, uh, the callers are, are trained, um, then that you're going to get you're going to get very different results. So what 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 Marcos is saying is, it may say wrong number, but it may not be a wrong number. But you're going to have to if that's your defense, right. you're going to have to do quite a lot of work uh, to show that that's the case. So. Though that's one piece of it, and the other is you dig into the account notes. Um, so, and, and oftentimes these account notes, uh, is particularly in the financial services industry, uh, are, are not electronically searchable. They are lots of very brief information which is written by customer service agents in abbreviations, and you have to dr dig through those. And so the idea to defend these is this is an individualized analysis when you go into the records, you're seeing that there was consent, even though despite the fact that the, own, the business records will say wrong number uh, or whatever the drop down code is, it's not really true. Um, and that's sort of where the rubber hits the road on the consent side. 
and, and for me, I just I, I can't let it go no, because right <laughs> being on the plaintiff like, side, no. I was trying to be polite, but I'm like, no, no, no. so when someone says wrong number in my opinion, and it's, it's supported by various decisions, just because it actually is their number doesn't mean that they're still prior express consent to call them. So we go back to on the plaintiff side, the 2015 FCC ruling, which looked at you know what does it mean to revoke consent, and they gave a, a very simple definition of that, which was the consumer telling the caller that they don't want to receive calls anymore. Just as simple as that. So from my perspective, someone saying that, well, you have the wrong person, stop calling me, that constitutes revocation of consent, which I know you beat that argument recently, but we've also you know, made the argument successful. Yeah, and I, I think there's actually a, a good distinction that we should maybe draw. I mean, you have, I guess the worst cases from the, from the defendant's perspective are the, the true wrong number cases where the plaintiff is not your customer and either you called a number that belonged to a customer at some point and they just changed it and they never told you or it's a mistake. It is a, a truly, you know, we call them fat fingered case where the person, the customer maybe when they were giving the phone number at the time when they applied for the account just gave the wrong number and you don't know it's a wrong number until you've reached out to try to contact your customer and surprise, it's not your customer. Um, in the customer context, I mean, many, I'd say probably almost all of my clients have an arbitration provision which precludes class actions. So that's gonna be your first response if you have, if it's your customer. Um, but it's those situations where they're not the customer, you're that, yeah, then that's right, where that's where really the, the bulk of the fighting happens. Can you talk a little bit about the nuance that comes into this with reassigned numbers? Because those, yeah. these are all call, these are cases relating to cellular telephone numbers, right? Not landlines. Right, right. I mean, uh, that's a good point. So the the TCPA has restrictions on the use of um, dialing systems to call landlines, but it's a little bit different. Um, so we're not really talking about that today. But um, yeah, the reassigned number problem is, and I'm sure we may even have a slide, or we can come up with one. Let's but see. I think <laughs> a very very high number of cell phones get recycled. And it happens um, very easily. And so what you run into is you run into these situations where you may be calling a phone number that you got from a customer, um, but it's just no longer their number. And you run into now you know, trying to figure out how you can identify who the actual person is, um, but doing that on a separate class-wide basis. It's, it's a huge number. Um, you know, back back in the day, you know, your mom and dad kept their landline for 25 years until they moved out of the house. Uh, that's not the case with cell phones. And, and in particular, you find in these debt collection cases, people that have burner phones or prepaid phones, um, they, if you're, if, you're, if you're not paying your bills, if you're in debt, carrying a cellular telephone is expensive. And oftentimes they're not able to pay that bill, and that number gets recycled and put back uh, put back in for somebody else to take. And and calling your um, your credit card company who has been calling you to pay your debt and letting them know that you've changed numbers and let them know what the new number is, it's really not typically on the top of anybody's list of things to do. Oftentimes they'll recycle and get a new number just because you know where people get lots of debt collection calls if they're not paying and they, you know, they're trying to, uh, tr trying to not get those, n those calls. Um, so uh, the number of reassignment uh, on number uh, is, is sort of shockingly high when you look at it. It's in, it's in the, uh, I think you said there's something like 26 million a year. Right. Yeah, uh, numbers get recycled, uh, which is just a sort of a staggering number. Um, you know, I've had my cell number for 20 years, but there's, that's not typical. It really isn't. A, a large section of the population does not keep their cellular numbers for significant periods of time. They will cycle through different numbers, or they'll get multiple numbers. Um, and business phones, for example. Uh -huh. what's, the, what's the measure of success of the, number, of the pool that you're talking about in these cases? Well, if we're talking about debt collection cases, because there are very different types of cases. You've got marketing cases. Let's, you know, you, you, I worked as an expert on a a case for Universal Studios, and they were texting, um, marketing. They were sending marketing texts to a, about a, 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 a movie that was going on. That's a very different pool because that can be anybody. I'll, you know, that particular demographic was probably 18 to 30 year old men, but so it skewed young. Uh, but for debt collection, 
people under, I think it's people under, making under $30,000 a year, something like 50% of them cycle their phones in a, uh, in, in a one year period. It's very, very high. And on top of that, um, you know, it's, it's hard to know who's, who's gonna pick that n number up. And the, uh, well, we'll get into this, but the, there, there are not reliable, in my opinion, um, good uh, reverse cellular lookup services so that you can reasonably know who now has that cellular number. Because the telcos don't, pro don't produce directories the same, ways they d the same way they do with landlines. Um, so Marcus, can you tell, Um, yeah, why, why don't we do so that? So just to finish the point on reassigned numbers, yeah. uh, the FCC last year, I guess, approved a rule to create a reassigned number database, which is going to require the companies to actually submit, um, to tell I think it's within 15 days of a phone number being, a cell phone being disconnected, to put the phone number in this database, and then they have to wait another 45 days to reassign it with the hope or the, I guess, the intention that if you are going to be making phone calls, you can go to this database and scrub it to see if you have a number that's on there for a customer that's now been disconnected. Um, it's not been implemented yet. I think it's still being constructed. There, there's compelling narratives on both sides of this. You have you know, somebody who maybe is, is uh, getting dozens and dozens of debt collection <laughs> calls, and, and you know they've asked not to, to be called, and, and perhaps the, some, of the, the one, some of the corporate defendants don't have very good systems in place, so they keep calling them. That is a compelling story. And, and you know, when our clients come in and they have all kinds of uh, things that are called marked wrong number and the numbers, and they keep dialing it and that's a pretty easy, uh, uh, that's a pretty easy um, uh, query to run, you, know, you have to say, well, <laughs> that's not a great fact, right? Um, the narrative on the other side, however, is that you, let's say you're a debt collection company or you're, let's say you're a bank and, and you're sending out fraud alert texts and you now are sending them to the wrong number because your client, your customer has dropped that and the, nobody ever sends back stop. So you keep sending fraud alert texts to let people know that there's an issue with their accounts and you, know, you, could, have, you could easily send 20 of those and each one of them is $500 until somebody says stop. So there's, and that's, that's the issue. I think, I think there are, you know, the, the on each side, there's there's a story to be told, um, and it just depends upon the facts in the individual cases. Right, and on that that latter point, where there's a reassigned number, no notice to the caller, it's technically illegal, but <coughs> I personally would not want to file that case because, from the business perspective, there's no notice to them that the number has been reassigned at this point. So it's very easy, in our opinion, for a judge to look at that see the lawsuit and just think that it's, it's more of a gotcha suit than what I would consider some of the better cases to be. So I know within my firm, we do try and only jump in on a reassigned number if there's some sort of notice. And that notice can be from the consumer, uh, directly responding stop of the text message. It could also, in my opinion, be the consumer's outgoing voice message. You know, let's say the caller is trying to call Bob Smith, consumer, um, outgoing voice message says Marco Sasso. In our view, that outgoing voicemail would be noticed and we would file that lawsuit but without some sort of notice that we can establish we would not be jumping into litigation. The texts are kind of interesting because on the compliance side, it's, you have to be really creative to think of all the colorful language that somebody is going to use to tell you to stop texting because it's usually not just stop. <laughs> so, um, well, but and here, here's actually a point where um, if you do have that text message and the text message says, you know, text stop to stop the calls and the person responds with every other word in the dictionary except for stop, then, you know, there have been judges who said, look, it has to be a reasonable revocation. And if you're given the option just to say stop, but you say, please no, you know, please cease all further communications with me and you text this long sentence, um, some judges have said that's not reasonable. So. And I would agree with those judges. It feels very manufactured right. if there's a simple, a simple instruction to how to get these messages to stop, and they avoid saying that word. They you know, say everything but stop. It's just a manufactured case, in my opinion. Right, and then you'll see, you know, the the the, the text keeping on after that because it hasn't triggered whatever 
compliance mechanism there is in the, the database to stop the calls. Um, Marcus, are these expensive to defend? Yeah, well, I'm going to give the, the lawyer answer. It depends. Um, the, where the expense is going to start to come in is if you have a lot of data, one, to deal with, and you have to work with it. And like you mentioned earlier, I mean, you're dealing with call records, which could be you know, billions of phone calls. Um, so you're going to have to harness that and deal with that. Um, you know, the use of experts at class certification uh, has become a big component of the cases, um, especially the bigger cases, and getting experts involved uh, early. Please. Really, which is, um, <laughs> you know, I, th I think as soon as you know that this is actually not going to settle on any kind of individual basis and you're going to have to have this discovery fight, better to probably get somebody involved because they can help you as the lawyer talk to the client and that line of communication can open from the beginning. So, you know, look, I'm a lawyer. I don't do math, right? I don't do numbers. I don't do that. That's why we hire experts. Let them talk to the business. So that way everyone is speaking the same, lang same language when you have to then come to, you know, drafting your opposition papers later. Um, but that's really where the expense comes in. The timing thing is, is very important just on the, uh, on the expert side. I'll just pipe in on that quickly. We've worked on some cases where the dialer database was so big it took us three weeks to ingest it, to just run it because it went for four or five years back in time and there were billions of telephone calls on it. And so, you, you know, the, that just doesn't, you don't send that as an email attachment. Um, and it takes an enormous amount of time to upload it and then to to run run around it and see to make sure that you got all the data correctly and that you understand how it's working. And that's before you even start to do any of the analysis. So earlier rather than later, we get all kinds of calls at the last minute. My experts report is due in two weeks and you know, it's like, well, you know, we're not gonna, there's only so much we're gonna be able to do for you now. You know, the earlier the better, um, for sure. Um, so are they expensive to bring? When it gets to a certain point, of course. So in addition to the, the expert costs, what we'll see, especially in terms of marketing cases, is the can consent data is continually promised from some other entity. So for example, you know, we have a, a, the business that we sued who was the beneficiary of the cause, we'll say, the one that benefited from the business coming through the door. And then they keep telling us, well, we got the consent from this person, we talked to the, that person, then we have to go talk to another person who provided them with the consent. So what that entails is multiple depositions and third-party discovery all throughout the country. And now we're seeing a lot of dialers up in Canada as well. So when we're going and posing multiple different business entities and traveling throughout the country and even going up north, like I said, that's an, an added expense beyond the experts who can alone be six figures for us sometimes. Let's One more point on expense sure. that yeah. I just thought of this is, you know, remember you're dealing with a lot of a lot of customer and consumer information. So as the defendants, you know, we are very very mindful of the fact that we don't want to share, you know, birthdays, passwords, account full account numbers, right. uh, social security numbers, and so when you're dealing with producing that type of information, you know, what steps are you taking to keep that information private and protected? because um, so, much of that is not needed for the purposes of class certification. Um, that's a cost. You know, it's a cost that, you know, if you're dealing with paper records, for example, um, you know, someone has to pick through those. That's another expense that the client may not be mindful of as you are getting the case, but it is a cost on the back end that's, that is going to be significant, potentially. And I appreciate when you incur that cost before it gets well, to me because I don't want to look at that information. Yeah, and, and <laughs> I would, you know, joking aside, it's, it's enough data. I don't want to look through other stuff. Is they they like you know, many plaintiffs lawyers like to ask for everything, and when your response is well, that's great, but I have all this information. How am I going to keep it protected? Who's going to pay for it? Yeah, it kind of changes the discussion sometimes. But well, and I think it's a very legitimate thing. I mean, we've run across a number of opposing experts who work out of their houses, right. and. They, they don't. I mean, here you have a, a, a bank or a healthcare provider who has spent, you know, h 
maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars in data security. Uh, it's highly regulated and all kinds of um, very uh, um, highly confidential personal information. And then it gets handed on, uh, you know, on a hard drive to somebody who works out of their house. Um, so it, it's really very important to do a little bit of due diligence on both of the experts, both your experts and the experts on the other side, to make sure that they have the systems that are available, proper data security in place uh, when you're dealing with highly uh, confidential um, data. Um, and it's not always the case. It's actually sometimes shocking. Um, so I want to move on to professional plaintiffs, and I'll just tee this up with um, sort of a call that we got to a couple, two, three weeks ago from uh, the business um, uh, owner. It was a small company. Um, he'd been referred to us by um, counsel, and he was trying to save money by just talking to us directly. Um, we tried to explain to him why it's really important to have lawyers and a lot of communications. Um, and he said, I found out this person has sued other people before. This is an outrage. Can we get it, can we get it dismissed? Um, and the answer, of course, is uh, no. Um, so there are, but in, in TCPA in particular, you do see a lot of professional plaintiffs, people who this is, is probably the, the, their life, uh, you know, their life's work. Um, and, it, and, it, and it is surprising on the defense side, some of the, our, our clients, especially the small companies who just don't, aren't sophisticated enough to see it. Can you talk a little bit, um, Matt, about you know, your view of professional plaintiffs and, and, and uh, how you think the courts view them? I think the professional plaintiffs are really causing problems with the statutes. You know, as far as the TCPA goes, I think it's only second to the, the ADA for professional plaintiffs. So just to clarify our terms here, professional plaintiff, in, in my view, is someone that is, you know, for example, buying various cell phones, intentionally trying to induce callers to call them, and then jumping in with, with a lawsuit. And to me, that's just you know, outright abuse, to be frank. Uh, I do distinguish that from someone who simply knows their rights and has filed multiple lawsuits without trying to force someone to come in and violate the TCPA. So we, we have a very big distinction here. And I think it's easy from, from our perspective to identify who is someone that's simply a professional plaintiff and wants to get a bunch of money. So for example, if I get a call from someone that says, you know, my rights have been violated hundreds of times. I won a million dollars, and here they violated 47 USC 227, and they're trying to educate me based on their you know Google School of Law degree, and they say <laughs> they want that money, and I just respond and I want you to find a different attorney, because no matter how much money I get you, you'll think you should have gotten more, and you probably set this up as well. So professional plaintiffs, we really really try to avoid because I think it's easy for the judge and you know defense counsel to get in there and figure out. How did this call happen? Was it induced? And if so, then it's easy for the judge and understandable for the judge to go out of their way on you know, some questions that could go either way and rule in favor of the defendant who was tricked into this lawsuit. You want to talk a little um, bit uh, about Melody Stoops? Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, so I think to Matt's point, right, mm -hmm. there's a professional plaintiff who is just someone who maybe knows the law and frankly likes to be a class representative. And then there's someone who's, who's taking active steps to invite the calls. And I think that's where the courts sort of look and draw a distinction. To, and I think Peggy mentioned Melody Stoops, sort of a famous case um, where this plaintiff was essentially buying multiple phone numbers and phone and cell phones um, just in the hopes of receiving wrong number phone calls. And in <laughs> fact, I think I read there was a fact where she would take the phone call, phone cell phones with her on vacation, like in a box, so that she wouldn't miss any of the phone calls. Um, and it may have been the same case, or maybe a different case, but um, she would give the phone number or have her family members, or maybe it was a different case, family members use the same phone number on multiple different accounts. Again, to sort of create this harm. That is the type of plaintiff where you're going to get courts to say, hey, that's not what this statute's about can't invite a harm and then turn around and sue on it. Yeah, and Melody Stoops was um, purposefully buying telephone numbers that were uh, in South Florida because it was particularly hard hit and there was a lot of poverty there, kind of making it extra right. gross. Um, all right, let's, let's move on to expert witness, expert witnesses. Um, can you tell us what kind of experts you use and, and what's your situation? Of course. So 
there's a handful of extras that we're using in these types of cases. So as I mentioned in the beginning, one element of our prima facie case deals with the dialing technology. So is this system that is placing the calls to these cell phones an automated telephone dialing system? And what we do there is we retain an expert who can go in and examine the software and how the calls are placed to see if this telephone is something that's envisioned by the statute and was intended to be uh, subject to TCPA by Congress when enacting it. And in some cases, that's a very simple question when you know, we can look at it and it's dialing you know, millions of calls all at once, or if it's using a pre-recorded voice message, which takes it out of the ATDS question. But where it does become more interesting and a question that could go either way is when there's some sort of open source software that a defendant is using to uh, place calls, or they're using a proprietary uh, dialing system uh, where they don't want to give us the information about how it works. So that's usually the, the first expert that we're retaining, you know, someone that can look at the system to see if these calls are actually subject to the TCPA to begin with before we focus on some of the other questions of consent. And, and from there, the, the second type of expert that we tend to look at in these cases is someone to help us try to ascertain the class. A lot of that will be coming from reverse number lookups, which certainly has its issues because it's not a perfect system. And in that context, what we're doing with reverse number lookups is trying to figure out, with this telephone number, which person is associated with it. And how do we give them notice if we're going to give notice to the class, whether it's through settlement or a challenge class certification motion. So on our end, those are the two types of uh, experts that we tend to use. Now we are trying to find experts to look at the consent data, whether it was uh, fabricated or if it's legitimate. And that's becoming a more and more common ex uh, question that we're trying to look to on our end. Yeah, I mean, we, we really do the same. We have, um, like I said, someone who can handle large sets of data. Um, the technology piece, uh, ATDS is defined in the statute, but it's still an open question exactly what that means. And in fact, um, just last year, three different circuit courts reached three different conclusions. Um, and the FCC is at some point supposedly going to weigh in on this question, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. Um, and then com a compliance expert sometimes, uh, you know, because the, the damages are 500 to 1500, depending on whether it's willful or not. So I, I can tell you, having been in this space, pretty much my entire career, compliance has gotten better, and I think large uh, companies are doing a better job of trying to avoid these types of calls. But in the end, you're gonna have to convince a jury or a judge or someone that you're doing as best you can. So getting someone with industry experience who can opine upon that um, is helpful. And then, like to Matt's point, class certification. Uh, the, big, the big issue in these cases um, is ascertainability, depending on which circuits you're in, but really it's about who was called. Can you show it and can you prove up their claim on a class basis and how you get there? And that's where um, you know, experts come into play. And I've seen in these cases that there are a number of uh, class administrators who are typically on behalf of the, of the plaintiffs are used as experts to say, uh, for ascertainability experts to say, Essentially, yeah, I can find all these people who were called. Uh, I do it all the time. I, I'm a class administrator. That's my expertise. Do you find that there's any sort of ethical issues with that? Because these are the same people that are going to then, are hopefully going to get to administer the class and make a lot of money uh, administering the class. And, you know, in, in in my experience, we've always been, you know, my firm and every firm that I've worked at as experts has always been, um, you know, need to be Caesar's wife in terms of having any kind of economic interest in a case. Um, and yet you see these uh, class administrators uh, acting as experts on behalf of one of the parties. And I just wondered what your thoughts are on that, both of you. From, from our perspective, I haven't considered whether or not there, there is an ethical issue because the way I see it is no matter what the administrator is being utilized for, whether it's during the challenge uh, class certification motion where we need to convey to the court that 
we can find these individuals and here's how using this third party claims administrator versus when the claims administrator is being utilized to give notice of a settled class. From my perspective, their goal is always the same. Pursuant to Rule 23, we want, we want to give as many people as notice as possible. So, you know, it's actually an interesting question. I, I don't have a very direct answer, but to me, I think they're still doing the same job regardless of whether it's an opposed motion or you know, joint motion for preliminary approval. Uh, so I, I don't have an answer to that, to be honest. Um, I, I, from my feeling, I don't, I don't know if it's an ethical question. I, I view their jobs, I guess, as different than that. I think at the class certification stage, that's a different standard of proof that the plaintiff has to meet. And I think that's a, that's a different analysis than what you're looking at in the class administration notice piece of it, right? Because yeah. there, you're looking to get as broad a notice as possible because you need to cast as large a net because right. you need to go tell the judge that you've done the best you can do to identify as many people that might be within the class as you can. You're at a different stage in the case. So I don't know if it's an ethical question. I mean, me personally, if, you know, there's, there's a host of different administrators. So if we had opposed one at a class certification stage, I might probably be reluctant to use them on the notice stage, but I don't, I don't know. Uh, all right, let's, let's uh, move on to settlement. Uh, all these cases almost always settle. You know, it's, it's far too scary to be looking into the abyss of a billion dollar, <laughs> potential right. billion dollar. Uh, nobody wants to, uh, to be on that, uh, at least on the defense side of those. So they, they come to the table at some point. Um, when is it that you decide that now is the time to try and settle? Let's talk about first sort of true certification. Clearly, you win the certification motion, you're in a nice place as a, as a plaintiff uh, counsel. Prior to certification, when is it that you think I should, maybe we should start talking settlement? Do you want to start with this first? Uh, well, you, you okay, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sometimes people reach out to question. me first. But, you know, from, from my perspective, I want to reach out to defense counsel really as soon as possible. I, in my opinion, when there is ambiguity as far as class certification will go, and amb ambiguity on the merits, I think the, par the parties are in the best position to resolve it because we haven't spent you know, five, six figures in cost plus all of our time. And every stage of litigation that we get through, you know, if we beat the 12v6, if we certify the class, our settlement value just has to go up because it reduces the number of arguments that the defendant can make to try and, you know, can convince, or sorry, that, that the two of us can make to convince the court that, Your Honor, you should approve this class settlement because they have you know, fewer and fewer arguments to reduce the amount that we can see. So from my perspective, I try to come to the table earlier. I think it's easier to get it done. And especially in the context of Visalis, the, the Oregon verdict, that was $925 million. You know, we use that as do you want to get hit with that verdict, or do you want to come to the table now? We'll factor in your arbitration argument and your merits arguments and get something that It'll your, take your business. Million? Yeah, I, I'd be comfortable. <laughs> I'd be comfortable with seven hundred million. Yeah. That would be a good year. Uh, I, I, like I say, it, it sort of depends. I mean, there are, as we've seen, you have to be doing, I guess, more work now to show the, the court that actually the settlement has value. So. Um, if settlement is really going to be the path, then you know working with the plaintiffs in terms of discovery and getting the right discovery to to make that happen uh, may make sense. Uh, there are some people who know they just want to fight until they get an order, and in which case you just have to fight it. Um, but this, like, you know, like I mean, you should have that discussion early on, and because Peggy's right, I mean the, the numbers are pretty astronomical if you if you you know take a trial. Been given the, the, the five-minute warning a few minutes ago. Are there are there any questions that we can respond to? Yeah, Robin. Uh, so I, what I wanted to hear you speak to a little bit is that um, it seems like uh, the TCPA cases are fundamentally different from many other class certification matters because. Uh, your focus is almost entirely on that common impact question as opposed to the damages because right. your damages are statutory damages. So, you, you know, I, I guess you don't have the reliable 
model problem, but you do have to show that it actually created a, a burden on a person or, could you speak to well, that a little bit? Um, so you're right. I mean, the, the fight on class certification is not in a damages context, right? Your fight is gonna be, um, you know, they have the burden of showing that they can prove this across, across the class and your fight is gonna be, all right, well, what do, this, does the, do the records show you and then what methodology are they gonna put forward, right? And so it's a, you know, it's a predominance, usually, usually it's a predominance question. Um, it can be an ascertainability question depending on your circuit. In the Ninth Circuit, that's a loser argument. But the same sort of analysis, you're doing that same analysis, but you're doing it in the context of commonality and predominance. Um, so that's where the fight is gonna be. That's where you're, you're, you know, you're going and you're actually look, picking through individual account records to show that no, Judge, they've given you this methodology that says it could be one of these five people own the phone number, and what we're telling you is you have to pick through all these records, and you'll see that no, it's in fact our customer or we had consent. So that's where that fight really is. And it, the, going through the databases is, is the biggest part, the data analytics. We do that in advance of settlement when they're, uh, when they're in settlement conferences. We get you know, furious texts asking us to, if you slice it this way, how many of them have red hair? You know that kind of thing. So they're they're you know they're in the midst of negotiating something, and they're they're trying to figure out what the scope is going to be of particular um, characteristics. Um, it might be a date range. It might be the number that got called after X Y Z, and that's all straight up you know, uh, data queries, um, but it can make a big difference. You, you agree on one, one nuanced, one change, and you can drop out 100,000 calls. Um, so there's a lot of horse trading at the end of the day, and then it's, you know, what are you settling this for per call, you know, or you know, per individual telephone number? That's a big deal, right? I mean, aren't you? Of course. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's a big point. We could go on for, for hours, but I did see the, yeah. the hint. So <laughs> I guess we'll just wrap it up there. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>